morning, everyone. How are you? It uh, It is so good to be back here. We took a couple of weeks off from the podcast because of life. <laughs> and uh, it's nice to be back. It's good to just have this place that we gather and the routine of gathering regularly. I think that's really important. Uh, how are you all? The chat's already kind of going crazy and I see many, many, many familiar faces, pretty much everyone. Uh, so it's so good to see you this morning. Thank you for being here. This is episode 190 and it is Saturday, March 13th. It's actually one of my best friend's birthdays today, so I need to uh, text her later and wish her a happy birthday. We talked yesterday, but um, I have to do the thing today officially. <laughs> so I, um, I've actually been up since super early this morning because OH and S, so OHS, sorry, Ontario Hand Weavers and Spinners, um, they had a flax presentation this morning. It was excellent uh, and it just finished at 8 a.m. my time because it was hosted in Eastern Standard Time. So it started at 7 a.m. So uh, I was up early watching that and uh, like I said, it was it was excellent. So in the last couple of weeks, how have you guys been? How how are things going and what are you guys up to? It's, uh, I'm not going to lie, it's it's been a week here. It's been very intense. We've had a lot going on. Yesterday, uh, the wool circle, you guys were just amazing um, and so, so kind because I'd had a, a little bit of a rough morning. Um, but it's just um, so great to gather here and, and um, feed off of your energy uh, because even though sometimes I don't come with my at 100%, um, you know, you, you guys sort of being here and, and being enthusiastic and, and uh, just your kindness and all the things uh, helps me to feed, feed, off of, feed off of that. So thank you so much. So it's been, uh, yeah, it's been two weeks and I have actually, I've done quite a bit. Um, it's been busy. Like I, I had quite a number of shifts at work uh, to fit in. So for those who don't know and for those who are new here, um, I'm a, um, an ICU nurse at a big um, uh, trauma um, ICU. Um, I'm located just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia. And... Um, yeah, it, it and then I also had two very intense, very long days of filming for the School of Sweet Georgia, uh, which was really, really fun. It was very invigorating. When you haven't seen your friends for a year and you get to spend two full days together, granted you're wearing masks, but still, uh, it was that was really lovely. Uh, and I found that very um, restorative. Uh, so that was that was good. So in today's show, I have just a ton of projects to talk with you about today and to share with you. I've kind of got like a smattering of a whole bunch of different stuff. Theoretically, tomorrow, the housekeeping post for February, for March, March, how are we in March, you guys, uh, it will be posted. I, um, I need to go through and update some of the links and make sure that they're working. That's been the theme of the week this week is themes is, uh, uh, links not working. So, uh, that will go up tomorrow morning. So if you, uh, well, and it, um, uh, and it'll come out in the newsletter as well. So if you guys uh, are wondering about all the things, all the things that happen here at Woolen Spinning and the things that are happening in the community, uh, definitely watch for the Patreon post that's titled Housekeeping for March. It's a public post and it gives you an opportunity to kind of scroll through and see what's happening in the community. And if there's some stuff that you think you'd be interested in uh, and you're not sure how, like what to do and how to access it and where to go, just send me a note or leave a comment on the post itself and I will help you to navigate that. Um, the other thing you can do too is subscribe to the newsletter and that is available at wellforpearls.com and you can just fill out the bar at the top. You can find me on Instagram and Ravelry as Well for Pearls, and you can find me on the Slack channel if you're part of the Slack community here at Woolen Spinning um, as Well for Pearls underscore admin. So if you're looking for me or you want to tag me in something or message me, don't ever hesitate. Go, go for it. Um, you need to choose the one that says underscore admin. Um, it's so, so good. Oh, you've, uh, so Mars has been planting seeds this morning. Marjorie is spindle spinning. Marjorie and I live about 20 minutes from each other. Um, what else are people doing? Uh, Alberto's getting the coffee pot ready. 
Um, we've got, I know, uh, it was it, I think it was Dana said that um, she was knitting. Uh, Sarah is working on a sweater by Vera Valmaki. Valmaki. Um, Diane is celebrating her, her um, granddaughter's birthday party today. That's wonderful. And Diane, I'll be thinking about you as it's your husband's birthday today. Um, that's important to keep you keep you close and keep you uh, in mind. My, my dad's birthday is actually on Tuesday on uh, St. Patrick's Day. Um, thank you, Leanne. Yeah, I'm excited for the Sweet Georgia class to come out. I, I think I'm allowed to say this. Um, I think I'm allowed to, uh, to, to sort of let this little bit of information go. So we were finished filming on Friday and it was like 3.30 in the afternoon. And uh, Felicia said, you know, I just had a couple of questions. Do you think we could just keep the cameras running? And I said, oh yeah, no problem. And so um, we were, uh, the cameras were still running and she asked me a couple of questions and we ended up filming for another almost two hours. <laughs> So there's a bunch of like ad lib that uh, uh, Leah, um, the uh, video tech editor, she's been on Wool and Spinning Radio. She's a friend of mine uh, that she's uh, going to pop it, pop it in sort of at the end of the workshop. So I'm excited to see that sort of come to fruition. Uh, Lauren is spinning some Cheviot. I think that's the Cheviot that Lauren has been processing from Fleece, which is really cool. And Dana's spinning her Shetland. Um, her Shetland Mac, he's black and white. Oh, that's very cool. Cause Shetland, of course you get that true black. That's really neat. Um, sampling some Shetland. That's what Tracy's doing. She's just putting it through the carter. Maggie is drinking coffee and weaving. Dorothy's eating lunch. Oh, you guys always busy, right? We're always busy, always doing things. I was chatting with Lauren this week about productivity and doing all the things that we do. And part of it is um, multitasking, right? Like in a, in a meaningful way, not in, not in a destructive way. Um, you know, where you're watching something like this, or I was watching the webinar this morning and I was spinning away. That's uh, sort of what we do. Becca is prepping for dinner, of course, because in the UK it's getting close to dinner time. I wonder what you guys are having. And uh, Mark is here. He's enjoying the company in this space. It's been a week here too. I'm thinking of you. Anybody who's had a week, <laughs> you guys know what it's like when we have a week and nothing seems to go right and everything seems to be imploding. We just have to take a deep breath, don't we? I have to admit, we've had some beautiful sunshine and actually if the sun keeps streaming in, I will turn the blinds while the credits are running. Um, we, um, uh, yesterday evening, because it was this gorgeous sun. It was chilly, but it was a gorgeous sun. This is going to segue into me talking about one of my projects. Um, we, us girls in the cul-de-sac, there's four families and we're all really super close. And um, the three girls have kind of become, I shouldn't call them girls. We're all in our thirties and forties. Um, we, us women, um, we were uh, sitting in the cul-de-sac and they've, they've become like, you know, my, my people, you know, my, my best friends. And, um, we were talking and sharing life and I was telling them about some of the things that had happened this week and they're always so supportive. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to lace everything with a bunch of labels and criticize and, and, you know, say like, and get all inflamed and like this person screwed up and this person screwed up and I screwed up and you don't have to like do that with them. You know, you can just say like this happened and I'm just really bummed about it. And they're like, yeah. And they don't pile on, you know, like to me, that's true support. That's really hearing the other person and being there for them. So while we were talking and we were all sharing our week and whatnot, we were just sitting out um, in chairs and, you know, we're still physically distancing because we're still sort of having to do that. Um, we're slowly rolling out vaccinations and whatnot. I was spindling on my Gotland. So I actually got my third of the four uh, cops finished. So this is for my sweater spin. This is a uh, spunky eclectic uh, thread box. So maybe what we'll do is we'll run the credits and if you guys are up for it, just let me know in the chat. Uh, we'll start with this little spin and talking about it because uh, I'm actually really quite excited to um, be actually almost finished the color work of the yoked uh, pullover that I'm working on. So if you guys want to hear about that first, let me know. And uh, in the meantime, we will run the credits and get into the show.
So let's talk about the Gotland spin. So this is for a two ply that I am working on. And this was Spunky Eclectic's uh, thread box that was a colorway from, oh, now I'm going to forget. Was it from December or January? Um, I think it was from December. Yes, December. And um, I actually finished the first skein of yarn, which we talked about on the podcast. So I probably should show that to you guys. Um, this is washed and finished. Let me turn the cameras around. I thought I'd already done that. Sorry, you guys. So this is my two ply gauntlet that I have already spun. This is the first half. So the first two cops, uh, when we're talking about uh, uh, Turkish spindling, we're talking um, a cop is, is what you spin um, and make. And some people will take their cop when they're done and they'll grab from the inside and they'll grab from the outside. And actually, I'm not sure I can find my inside without messing this up, but you can grab from in here. And you can ply like kind of like a center pole ball. Um, I personally don't really like to do that unless we're camping and I don't have all of my winding equipment. What I like to do is actually just rewind these onto weaving uh, storage bobbins, onto weaving bobbins usually. And um, I just store them that way so that this doesn't get all messed up and fuzzy and, and all um, mixed up while I'm spinning my other cop. So what I was actually doing this morning... This is the beginnings. This was actually what I spun for the Sweet Georgia um, workshop that I was just spin, uh, just um, talking about. So this was the beginning of the of the cop, and of course I took out the uh, shaft of the Turkish spindle so that I could. And actually, I'm going to put this away because otherwise it it will get all mixed messed up. Um, but this is one of the nice things about, about, uh, storing a Turk, a Turkish spindle is you just, uh, when you're ready to start spinning again, you just pop the shaft back in. This is a brand new spindle. Um, so actually it's a little, it's a little bit stiff and then, uh, you can sort of start spinning again and get going again. So what I have been doing and what I was sitting here doing this morning after finishing that cop yesterday while I was sitting in um, the webinar was going through and just very, very gently, not a lot, just very, very gently um, pre-drafting this fiber and pre-attenuating it. And I've been adding a little half twist as I've been going through just to hold the gauntlet together and just make sure that it stays really, uh, really quite, quite nicely organized and doesn't start to just fall apart. Um, these long wools tend to start to drift apart a little bit if you if you sort of pre-draft and pre-attenuate to an inch within the, to within an inch of their life. And then as I wind up, I've been adding a twist so that it's nicely organized. And I've been uh, loading it onto, I was loading it onto a, a distaff, but I actually found that the distaff was a little bit too heavy for me. And so what I've been doing is actually just using one of my cuff distaffs, my knitted cuffs. And I have been um, wearing that around my wrist and then I can um, organize, keep the fibers organized. So what I was actually doing this morning was I was pulling these apart like this, just very, very gently and going all the way, all the way down to the end. And then going through and just doing that exact thing and just pre-drafting all the way along. I removed the shaft just for storage, uh, just for transportation so that you don't, you're not transporting it like this. Great question, Leanne. Um, so that you're not transporting it like this. If you take the shaft out, you can just slide it all into a little uh, bag. And I happen to, for the Sweet Georgia workshop, I had everything organized in little Ziploc bags. And um, it just made sense to sort of take it all down for transport. It's one of the nice things, like if you're traveling with Turkish spindles, um, if you're traveling and you've got your bags with you and whatnot, like if you're going onto an airplane, because in the future we'll be able to travel again, um, or like for me when we're camping, I can just throw it all into a, a little, uh, what I actually use is a makeup bag, um, like a little uh, hose, uh, uh, toiletries bag. And I find that actually works the best. So yeah, the colors are pretty shocking, um, Kathleen and uh, Leanne. The the colors of this particular colorway, um, Amy really, uh, of Spunky Eclectic, she really knocked it out of the park. 
So that's what I've been going through and doing because what I'm actually hoping is it's supposed to be an absolutely glorious day here. And I'm really hoping that I can spend some time this afternoon outside after queries and explorations. And my plan is actually to keep spending on this and maybe, maybe, uh, because we're on spring break now and the kids are home all week, we'll be sort of out and about and going for walks. And we've got a couple of outdoor dates um, uh, scheduled with friends so that we can, uh, kids that are in the kids cohorts at school um, and in their classes and whatnot. And that means that we'll, I'll be outside quite a bit. And I thought, you know what, what a great opportunity to get this part of the spin finished because I have the gray Gotland that's going to be the background. So the naturally colored gray Gotland is here. And this is actually going to be the background of my Colorwork sweater. So this is a spindle project, a spindle spin that I've got going this year. There's several people in the community that are doing the same thing. And I sort of thought, like, if I can keep the momentum going and keep on spinning just keep spinning, just keep spinning, I will be able to um, keep on keep on working on this and maybe actually have enough yarn um, to do a sample. I would really like to do a knitted sample before I go too, too much further into this spin. So I'm going to get this spun up because I'm already committed to this yarn and then I'll do the gray. Uh, and I'll spin up enough that I can actually do like a knitted swatch. My plan is the Aurelius, Aurelia, Aurelius. What, what's the pattern that I'm doing, you guys? <laughs> you guys probably know better than I do. It's the uh, Aure Aurelius by uh, um, Jennifer Steinglass. So I've linked it for you here. Oh, Dana, good question. You, were, you and I, we were on the same page three days in a row. I tell you, we're going to start having the same thoughts. So it's the... Uh, Aurelius by uh, Jennifer Steinglass. And actually, I don't think, so this is 75 yards. I don't think that I'll have enough to do color work in the cuffs and at the hem of the sweater. Um, the sweater doesn't have any color work at the hem. Sorry, it's only at the cuffs. I don't think I'll have enough to do that, but I'll just see where I'm at when I uh, finish the color work yoke. So, um, and I actually chose that particular pattern for a reason because the yoke of that sweater moves through multiple colors. Like it's, um, I don't know if it's, yeah, it's spin cycle yarns dyed in the wool. So it has this natural movement of color through the yoke. And, um, so this yarn will move and shift. And so I thought that was a good, um, a good pairing. The other thing, the other reason why I chose it is because I was spinning to a heavy sport like DK, roughly 12 wraps per inch. And, um, Gotland, the Gotland just spun naturally at that, that, um, thickness. And I was getting a really nice yarn. It's drapey. It's got a, just a lovely, um, halo to it. Um, a little bit of a sheen. And I just thought, why, why fight with a good thing? It's got a low twist angle, but like, I can't break this with my hands. It's so strong. Um, it's nice and low twist, gently spun, lots of halo. Let's see if I can come up a little bit so the camera will focus. Gorgeous colors. So do a knitted swatch and then I'll go from there. If I don't like the knitted swatch, then, you know, we'll, we'll reassess. Uh, great question, Dana. I think that um, Diane was able to answer your question. Um, it's a knitted, it's an, it's just a cuff. Um, there's usually, uh, you know, an inch and a half, two inches wide, um, a wrist distaff. It literally is the cuff of a sweater. Um, and you cast off and then you can tuck your fiber in. So what it looks like is like this, like this. <laughs> um, you're spinning and you're, you're, fiber is actually tucked into, let me get rid of that. Hang on. Um, and your fiber is tucked into your cuff like that, like a, like it's a wrist distaff. Um, and then as you're spinning, it keeps your fiber from entering into the twist zone. So where you're actually spinning. And so then as you wind your fiber onto your cop and you need more, um, you're able to just kind of pull the next little bit out. Um, and then you can keep on, keep on spinning, just keep spinning. I feel like this is a theme today. Um, and what I really like about the Gotland and spinning it on the Turkish spindle, uh, this is a turtle made. 
Uh, the, this spin, these spindles are about 35 grams, um, so sort of a medium to heavier weight spindle. And what I like about them is with the Gotland, this was something that came out in our study when we did Gotland as a breed study in wool and spinning. Katrina had dyed up these gorgeous bats for us that were a gradient from green through to yellow through to purple. And so we were looking at natural shades and how they take the dye. And then we were also looking at these uh, split complement colors. And what a lot of people found with spinning the Gotland was how easy it was to overspin. Like we just could, like people were really struggling with, with overspinning it and um, creating too much twist and resulting in like a really ropey yarn. And I think some people actually were a little bit freaked out um, by the spinning process and the results that others were having and ended up kind of stashing the fiber. Um, you know, cause I think some of these fibers are, you know, they're a, lo a little bit intimidating. I think it's important to, to, to do some trial and error and to, um, uh, you know, experiment and see what works. But because, um, because of that, what I sort of found in my sampling process was I really enjoyed, um, spinning these fibers on my Turkish spindle because it is a little bit heavier. And as soon as the fibers have sort of taken all of the twists they can take, it backspins. So it's almost kind of like a built-in check and balance um, where you've got these, you know, this Scotland fiber that is, is um, just doesn't want a ton of twist and it wants sort of a, a lower twist amount. It, it, these are coarser, higher micron, um, higher micron count fibers um, and they don't need a lot of twist to hold together and to be strong. And so because of that, um, you just don't need to put a lot of twist in and a great way of sort of regulating that if you're especially if you're a newer spinner is to do that on a on a slightly heavier spindle that's going to backspin if, if the twist really uh, builds up too too much so that is what i have been doing and i'm really really enjoying this a lot i can see you guys have a whole bunch of questions um, do I hold the fiber in a particular way when you tuck it in? So I wrap it up. I'll show you. I'll do this again so that you guys can see. So I wrap it up like this and I'm adding twist as I wrap it. Um, and then I sort of nestle it together. So it's like a, like a tube. And then I, I try, try is the operative word here to put the fiber that I'm taking next at the top. And then I tuck it in. So I try to kind of keep it organized so that the fiber is at the top that I want next. And then I can just pull it out. It doesn't always work. Sometimes it gets all mixed up and messed up. I find the more I spindle spin and the more I do it regularly, the more I'm able to do it. Does that make sense? So um, another question. Oh, awesome. Kathleen, she just ordered a, a turtle made spindle. That's a turkey, a turtle. Turkish. That's wonderful. Um, do you know what your twist per inch is for the Gotland spin? Great question, Kelly. All oh, these good questions. Um, I think it's about two, but let me check. Let me just pull this out and put it away because I don't want it to get messed up in the podcasting paraphernalia that we have out on the table here. Case in point. So let me just put this away and let me just pull out my skein here and I think I have a ruler here I should I had one earlier I was measuring dowel and it's a very exciting life that I lead <laughs> I was measuring dowel um where did my measuring tape go so great question Kelly let's have a look I, I'm pretty sure it's two so this is a two ply um, I can tell you off the bat as well, my twist angle is like 20 degrees because I had measured it before. So let me just zoom in the camera and then you guys can see this all up close. How we do the thing. How we do the measuring of the thing. So hang on. Okay, so let me zoom in here for you guys. And I'll rotate slightly just so that I can get out of that really bright light because the, the um, table wants to reflect that. So it's a bit hard to see. So let me just go over here. All right. So you can do this one of two ways. You can put your um, fiber under your protractor or you can put it on top of your protractor. I tend to like to work on top. That's just me. There is a magnifying glass here in the middle, um, depending on your brand of, of protractor. 
Um, you line it up parallel, depending on your protractor, uh, your lines might be a different way. So if your lines are like this, then you, you line it up like this. Either way, it's the same. Angles work the same no matter which way you're looking at something. Uh, so this twist angle is about 20 degrees. 15? No, it's about 20. It lines up beautifully with the 20 degrees. And then um, for the twist per inch, let's have a look. So you can measure your twist per inch um, one of two ways. You can measure it by doing your bumps per inch or you can do it twist per inch. So I have, I like to use a pen or something to just kind of point out where I'm at. I'm sorry that my hand is in the way, but I have to kind of hold it. So let me see if I can just move this a little bit down so you can really see. So I like to measure, I like to line up one of the corners of the uh, um, angles here, uh, uh, right, at the, right at the corner here. So if you were measuring bumps per inch, you would measure one, one, two, three, four. So the bumps per inch of this yarn would be four. Or it's a two ply, you can do the true twist per inch and you just divide it by two for a two ply and it's two twists per inch, which is what I thought it was. So if you're not sure and you want to check another part of your yarn just to be sure that you're applying evenly and that your results are consistent, you could go over here. One, two, three, four. So the trick here is to look at keeping your twist angle really super consistent. And then you can also, um, you know, have a look at your twist per inch. If your twist angle isn't really super even, uh, sorry, if you're, yeah, if your twist angle isn't really super even in your plying, your twist per inch are not going to be super even in your plying um, because you're going to have some areas that are higher um, twist and some areas that are lower twist. So it's just a great way of kind of documenting. So when I go to ply the yarn, um, I will be able to have a look and see um, what, um, what it looks like in comparison to this skein. And I know kind of what I'm going for. Does that help? <laughs> Kelly, I'd say my spindle hits the floor at least 50% of the time. That's wonderful. That's how we learn, <laughs> right? All right, let's go on to the next thing. Yeah, it's so true. Um, um, Alberto was saying that uh, luckily a hat doesn't need much consistency. And of course, this is the way that we learn, right? Like we start by just kind of measuring our yarns. And then as we learn, we do more. And then as we you know, move on to the next thing, we do more. And that's, that's how we build and that's how we learn. I finished uh, one of my Longway Homestead spins. So this is part of the 12 month breed study from Longway Homestead. This is the fin. So this was a really interesting spin. And I'll zoom the camera in a little bit so that you can see. This was a, a pin drafted roving, just like all of them are. And um, I had spun, the first one that I spun was the Rambouillet. Um, Rambouillet, if uh, you're Loreline and you're Francophone. Um, I love how she says it. Like nobody can say it quite like quite like the French. Rambouillet, I, I need to like have a lesson with her of like how to say it exactly. So Rambouillet, actually I have my skein right here. So let me grab it. So this is a 12 month breed program and um, you basically subscribe for 12 months and then after the 12 months it just self terminates. So this was my first skein. This was my Rambouillet um, that I that I spun through and it was a pin drafted roving and then this was the second one that I've been able to get through which is uh, the fin. I have uh, the Corydale and the Icelandic to do next. And I am going to try to keep up. Um, I'm going to try to sort of keep spinning and, and get through it because I, I would like to have the 12 yarns and be able to kind of line them up and and see their differences. With the uh, fin, you can see how wooly it is. It's very, very um, airy and light. Um, both of these yarns are very airy and light. They spun very fine. They both spun long draw. Um, I didn't find either of them really like fast spins. 
I found they were both actually quite slow and took took a while. It's amazing when you're spinning long draw, but you've got pin drafted roving. Uh, the four ounces goes a really long way. Like you just kind of keep on spinning. Um, so very light, very airy, uh, really nice twist angle for the finished ply, uh, very fuzzy surface of the yarn. So like the, the, you know, you can't really see the individual strands of the individual singles. Uh, same with the uh, Rambouillet. Um, you can see even when I hold it up close, like you can't see those individual strands. Of course, there's hair in here. Um, I have been carding Kiviet all month and I now I'm finding Kiviet guard hairs in everything. Um, it's a wee bit frustrating, but I'm also like, this is so amazing. <laughs> so uh, the fin, so both of them very wooly, both of them very light. Um, if I undo the, uh, the Rambouillet, you'll, you'll really be able to see like, you know, even in skein form, like it, it just gets really compacted and I have to kind of open it up and air it out, give it some really, really firm snapping. Um, so I was actually thinking about storing these yarns like this open, um, rather than in sort of a, a tight skein. Uh, because they're just, they're bouncy and sprungy and airy. And like, look at that bulk. Like it just bounces right back. Um, same with the fin. So really fun kind of side-by-side -side example of uh, two fine wools, very fine and uh, uh, moderately fine, both equally soft, both next to the skin. This one's kind of a little, it feels a bit more um, springy and sprungy. This one feels a little bit more um, like what I would, think of when I think of Targi and Polworth. Um, really, really interesting spins, both woolen. Um, yeah. So I'll just have a look at the chat and see if you guys have any questions. I know Dorothy had a question about Turkish spindle spinning. Any tips for how to neatly start an additional layer? So I don't bother to try to lay my singles on my um, Turkish spindles next to each other. I just randomly wind. Uh, my friend Diana, who actually, I think she's in the chat today. I thought I saw her. Maybe I didn't. Um, we've talked about this a lot, her and I, because there's beautiful photos on Instagram of just perfectly wound Turkish cops. And um, the thing is, is like what I find is when you start, when you wind them, when you wind the cops um, onto storage bobbins or a plying ball, um, I find it lifts off like the whole layer. Uh, that's what I have found. Diana's found the same thing. So I just randomly wind and it's faster. Like wh what's your time worth? So, um, do you know if there's any more of that? For I, I don't know actually, Wendy, if the, if I don't know if, um, this was a club colorway and I'm not sure, um, if Amy has, has any on the website, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, it's a huge amount of yardage then. I'm not sure how much exactly because I wasn't sure what my wastage would be. So I actually need to rewind both of these yarns uh, and do do some yardage calculations because this one is at least 500 yards. This one I suspect is in at least the 400 range. Um, and the thing is when you're getting into that kind of yardage for one skein of yarn, like you could really do a lot with these. So once I have them all spun, um, I would actually have like a significant amount of, uh, yardage to do something with. I don't know if I would use them all in one project cause I'll probably have over, well, if there's 500 yards per skein, just on average, um, and some are going to be more and some are going to be less, like the Icelandic is denser, so it's going to be less. Um, but if we just give a round number of 500 and we have 12 skeins at the end, that's going to be over, well, it's going to be over 6,000 yards of yarn, right? Is my math, math correct? I'm doing it off the top of my head. But you can see how big these skeins are. They're nice and round and they're hard to wind. They're hard to wrap actually because they are so big. Um, lots of VM in both of them. Um, and, uh, but, but overall just really rustic, really lovely. I might even, one of the other thoughts that I had too was I might actually dye, um, dye these. 
Um, once they're all done, I might split them all in half and dye half just to compare them side by side. So split the skein in half yardage wise and then dye half and use the, and then try to use them together in a project. So, I mean, the creativity and what you can do with these, it, it just never ends. I mean, really like it's, it's just going to go on and on and on what I can do with them. I started a new, uh, sweater project. Yes. All two ply Julie. Yeah. I think so, Jackie. She was asking if I stored them untwisted, if I would just put them in, pop them into a Ziploc. I think so. I also have some bins that I've been uh, chronicling and organizing um, and documenting like what's in my stash um, so that I can go by bin number and search what, what stuff is in. And I might actually just kind of like put them like wine, um, just sort of wrap, uh, you know, like how we make the circles of fiber. Um, where I take it like, like this and just put it on the bottom of the bin and just sort of like, you know, wrap it, wrap it along the bottom and just kind of lay it like that in the bottom of the bin. Um, I've got, uh, unfortunately, fortunately, I'm up to about three bins full of hand spun yarn plus, plus a whole bunch more. Um, and I'm kind of starting to get to that point where it's, it's a bit too much and uh, I'm really, I've been really going through my stuff and really trying to figure out like, okay, what am I going to do with this? Um, and if I'm not going to do something with it, um, I've, I've been thinking about, I haven't done it, but I've been thinking about putting uh, some of them on Etsy and, and putting a price on them. And if people want them, um, I'm happy to sell them. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I haven't gotten to that point yet, but I'm thinking about it. This is... Um, I love, I love reading all of the comments, you guys. So I'm sorry that I've kind of just zoned out for a second. I'm just reading what you guys have been, um, have been saying. Um, it's funny, Mar. So she was saying that she has a whole, huge amount of rambouille and she's been th spinning it thicker. You know, it's interesting because these fine wools can do so much and, um, they can be spun in many, many different ways. And I think that, um, you, with with some of them, like I've been finding this with my Cormo, it just wants to spin fine. You know, it takes a lot of twist. They've got a huge amount of crimp. Um, they just want to spin fine. And so just, you know, as you're spinning, just go with it. You know, see see how it how it takes the twist and what it looks like. I think that's really important. Um, I still go two over, one under. That's right, Dorothy. I just don't wrap um, the cop itself evenly. Like, I, it just doesn't look... It's still two over, one under, two over, one under, but it just doesn't look, here, let me go under here. It just doesn't, I just don't wrap in layers. I just, um, in terms of like lining up all the singles, it's just random. And I actually wrap quite tightly. So um, I actually wrap the singles quite tightly um, as I'm holding them. And I find that keeps the cop um, a little bit more, um, when you pull it apart and when you're winding off, I find that it's easier to do that. Um, I have sold some skeins to my guild members and have a good feeling of relief. You know, it's funny, Becca, because I think sometimes you just kind of want to like let go of some things. In terms of value in hand spun, there is a lot of formulas out there for selling handmade goods. If you look up a uh, jewelry, handmade jewelry cost calculator, there's a whole bunch of calculators out there that are automatic that you can find. Um, a good rule of thumb for hand spun is nine cents per yard. So if the skein is, um, let's say the skein is 500 yards and it's two ply. So it's 1500 yards of spinning because you've got two singles and plying. So if it's nine cents per yard, that would be um, nine cents times 1500, this skein would be $135. So that's just like a quick and dirty way of doing it. Um, if it's not luxury fiber and it's like, you know, something like Coriadel or something where the fiber is a little bit more affordable and a little bit cheaper, some people will do five cents a yard. So five cents a yard would be for a, um, 1500 yards of spinning would be $75. So um, that's how you can do it. So nine cents would be something like BFL Silk, Polworth and Silk, um, Gotland, 
um, you know, it's something that's a little bit more kind of um, luxury where you maybe spent a little bit more money on the fiber. And then five cents or six cents would be um, something like Corydale, Romney, like this, that's just kind of um, a workhorse fiber. That's that is just a way to a, a place to start. Um, Abby Frankmont has written quite a few blog posts about pricing your hand spun and um, you can have a look there. It's very helpful. I have been working on this. This is part of a sweater spin that I have been working on to go in tandem with this spin. So this was um, another Fiber Club. I, I don't have any Fiber Club subscriptions anymore, but I did do a couple uh, through the sort of the bulk uh, right in the middle of sort of the uh, pandemic when we were all home so, so, so much. Um, so this was, uh, I think it was Bitterroots. I always ask Maggie. I'm always like, which one is this one again? This is the Kent Romney that was from Hello Yarn. Um, and it was her, uh, it was Romney, um, it was uh, Sweet Treats. This one's Sweet Treats from November. Um, and so I spun this on the Plyology wheel when I was doing the um, review for them. And I spun it as a two ply. It's a heavy sport. And I loved it so much. And then when Mike got me uh, the Kromsky Minstrel for Christmas, it was a big, big, big surprise on Christmas Day. I cried. Um, I With it came um, eight ounces, half a pound of Romney in the maize colorway. And this fiber isn't particular. It's not like nice fiber. It's a little bit... Uh, workhorsey in the sense that it's uh, a little a little bit toothy just a, just a wee bit I think the micron count on it was like 35 or 30 34 35 and um, it's got some VM in it it's in the maize colorway um, and so what I've been doing this is the other half of, this is four ounces it was eight ounces in total I've been taking it and stripping it down and stripping it down, I think four or six times so that I end up with strips of fiber that are about like this. And then once again, just very, very gently pre pre drafting and pre attenuating. And I've been spinning to match this yarn. So it won't be quite as fine as this and sort of soft, if you will, you guys know how much I dislike that word. Um, but I am spinning to match it. So on my control card, um, I figured out sort of what I need to roughly spin the singles to to apply to um, the same yarn that I had made here. So this yarn is um, about 3.3 twists per inch. So it's a two ply and um, I had done 21 wraps per inch for the singles. And then the finished yarn is about 14 wraps per inch or a uh, sport. And after washing, it did poof ever so slightly. So I would say it's a heavy sport at, at like a heavy 14 wraps per inch. Not quite 15. So I've been spinning this on my Lendrum. This is the first bobbin done. This is a lot of fiber. It feels really dense and really packed. And I've actually been organizing it on my distaff. So um, this little distaff I borrowed from my friend Kim McKenna. It was my favorite one of all of them, except for another one that you'll see in a minute that I've been spinning my Karma blend on, which we'll talk about next. And um, what I've been doing is playing with different wrapping techniques. So wrapping from, from the top, wrapping from the bottom, doing different ways of like wrapping clockwise, wrapping counterclockwise. You can see that this is the fiber that's coming off. And what I've actually been doing, and let me switch cameras here. Uh, great question, Dana. Is Shetland a luxury fiber? I think it really depends on where it's coming from and what you're um, considering luxury. Um, you know, and and sort of what the what the price tag is. You know, um, I I probably wouldn't consider Shetland a luxury fiber, but I would consider it a slightly rare fiber. Um, whether it's single coated, dual coated, or some or an intermediate would be something to take into consideration. Um, and and then of course it also depends on whether or not you're uh, dyeing it by hand and the cost of your equipment, the cost of your tools. But I don't, I personally wouldn't consider Shetland um, a luxury fiber per personally. I wouldn't consider Cheviot, Romney. Um, all of the kind of medium wools, which you guys know how I feel about that, that label. Um, I wouldn't consider those luxuries, Suffolk, um, Cheviot. Um, however, Shetland silk, I would consider luxury. Yeah. 
So what I've been doing is I've got this vase <laughs> that I have a whole bunch of my silk yarns in and um, you guys are probably thinking like, oh my goodness, Rachel, like you are so ridiculous. But it's ended up being with the yarn in there and I'm, I am going to switch out the yarn because if I keep doing this, I, I don't want to have luxury yarn. Speaking of luxury, I don't want to have luxury yarns being my distaff holder uppers. So I need to switch out the skein. So you guys can laugh at me in the meantime, but I will change out my distaff holder uppers but what I've been doing is I've been putting it into my vase and I've just been spinning off the uh, distaff like that and sometimes I hold it and sometimes I pop it into my holder and um, this has just been working like excuse my language a hot damn it has just been perfect um, and I've been spinning with a, one of our little um side tables here um we, i've got these are nesting tables um and this one's just got my flowers on it that mike and james gave me and nora uh for international women's day uh they got me a, a bouquet and they got nora a, a bouquet and um yeah i've just been putting this on there um on a on a little um mug rug and um spinning off of that and i've been spinning this like i said on my lendrum and it has been lovely i think i've kind of figured out how i like to wrap the distaff um i find if i wrap it a little bit more gently and a little bit more um uh, not really super firm and it's kind of a bit more airy and a little bit more uh it kind of looks like um cotton candy I find that the fiber comes off really super easily and uh, with the other one what I've been doing is actually putting it upside down on a table and rotating it as I go so this has actually been working really super well where I actually put it on the table itself and if you watch my the smaller video as this is unwinding on the table here um, I, you can see that it kind of just comes off in a really nice way and so that's been working really super, really super well. Um, so I've just been playing with it and I find that the less packed it is and the more the fiber is kind of just very gently wrapped on and it looks like cotton candy, the, the, the more I use them and uh, enjoy spinning off of them. And I find that, you know, you kind of get this like, you know, bundle of, of cotton candy here and it just, uh, it just really uh, works really quite well. This particular distaff is a half inch piece of dowel and uh, I really like the weight of it. We were talking about that yesterday in the wool circle and uh, it's just a really great weight for my hand and my wrist um, and what I like to hold. So play with that. It's about 45 inches long, about. about. So if you're trying to recreate that, that's, that's about what that is. Um, yeah, yeah, he did, uh, him and James. It was a good, it was a good conversation with James and a great way of sort of explaining to James, um, about what we were, uh, why it was important and why it was important to get something for Nora as well. And, and what, what it was that we were celebrating my karma spin. So this spin keeps getting put off to the side because of other projects. Like I said, I've been working a lot on Kiviet and, um, I've been, uh, I, I've been really craving some spins to just kind of tie up loose ends, if that makes sense. And um, so that was the reason for trying to get that fin finished. And the other project that I've been trying to finish is my Karma. So this is West Coast Color. Um, this was, let me put this in front of my face so that it will uh, um, focus. Uh, this is West Coast Color and this is her Karma blend and it's 50% Merino, 50% Yak. The reason why I have this in this little holder is because this is the other half of the bobbin that I'm spinning right now. So once again, I've been, um, you know, stripping it down. Yak is very, very short stapled and we are going to spend some time talking about yak in the summer. Um, and what I've been doing is if you hold this fiber too tightly and too closely in your hands, um, and you're really kind of gripping it, um, you, you start to, we've talked about this before, but you, you start to separate the merino and the yak apart. So even though the merino is quite fine stapled, you are not very long stapled. It's longer compared to the yak. And if you have a death grip on it, it just all separates in your hand. So what I've been finding has been really, really helpful is this particular distaff that I borrowed from Kim that I love this one as well. These two are my absolute most favorites. The one with the Romney and the one with the Karma. Again, it's very light and it's got a nice kind of um, lever to it. It's got a nice feel to it. I 
wanted to show it to you in the video here, so that's why I'm holding it, but um, I've been putting it um, on the table next to me. I've been putting it in my, in my distaff folder, <laughs> i.e. my vase. Um, I've been playing with different ways of kind of holding it. I really like spinning this way. This, to me, is very intuitive. It's very easy. The fibers just naturally unwrap. They're very, very, very lovely. Um, and so I've been taking the fiber and just holding it so that it doesn't rip apart and just stripping it down and stripping it down and, and wrapping it onto, onto the distaff. So this is half of it. And then I've got the other half, um, here left to be spun and the yarn that it's been creating is here. So I'm doing a combo spin. I actually have two colors. This is the first half of the spin. Um, I have two colors of this Karma in my stash. I accidentally bought quite a bit of it. Um, and so this was the first skein of the um, one colorway plied with the other colorway. And this is the other colorway. Um, and then I'm doing it again. So I actually have a bobbin spun. This was on my Lendrum Saxony. I am kind of mixing it up just because wheels aren't free right now. Um, so this is the first, the third bobbin. I'm spinning the fourth bobbin and then I'll ply those together and then I'll spin the fifth and sixth. So I have, um, this is the sixth bobbin that'll get prepped. And then I've already prepped the fifth bobbin. And that's all of this. So very dark, moody, you know, these moody, dark colors. I love them so much. Um, and this is going to give me a fair amount of yardage to do something quite substantial with. So I'm actually quite excited about that. Um, and I've just been keeping it all together so that I have it all organized and have it all together. So let me just catch up with the chat because you guys always uh, have lots of great questions. Um, if you are wanting to get a disc staff, you do not need to spend any money. Um, you can just go to your local hardware store and get a piece of half inch dowel, sand it down, cut it to, I'll measure this for you so that you know exactly how much, how long it is. This is 20 inches long. So cut it down to 20 inches long, half inch piece of dowel, give it a sand. Bob's your uncle. You're good to go. And you spent like what, three bucks? So yeah, it doesn't have to be something really super formal or expensive. Um, in terms of the apron, thank you so much for answering, um, the question about the spinning apron. Um, every time I wear it, I get questions about it and I'm always like, just talk to Katrina. Um, yeah, that's a great, a uh, great comment there, Mars. Uh, distaffs, distaves are so appealing to eliminate some of the joining bumps, um, and inconsistencies. I really find too, that as you're spinning with the distaves, um, it, like this is a great example where on the distaff I had all the fiber organized and ready and then when I got to the end I could have prepped it so that I had pre-drafted each sort of thing um each length of fiber I could have pre-drafted so that they kind of like pre-draft together you know where you go like this you lay them over top of each other and you sort of pre-draft it together, but if, and then you kind of give it a bit of a twist, but I found with the yak, um, it was really hard to do that. And some of this got, got a little bit beaten up, uh, some of this fiber. So I found it was actually a better use of my time to just go through, strip it down, um, and then strip it down again. And then spend the time um, pre-drafting and then just lay it onto the, onto the distaff. So the one thing that I have found is that if I leave my, my, a distaff loaded with fiber, um, I found that it, it really is to my best interest to try to spin it relatively soon. Um, because the fiber is nicely prepped, it's airy, it's, um, ready to go. It's kind of like spinning a fresh bat. Um, it's got all that air in it and it's just really beautifully prepped. You've spent all that time and, uh, leaving it to sit, um, I found kind of compresses the fiber a little bit and 
it's not it's not quite as nice to spin because here when I'm getting to the bottom of the of this distaff um, that I'm spinning from I prepped that fiber quite a long time ago and um, I'm down to the last couple of a couple of turns and um, it's a little a little bit compressed because I wrapped it a little bit more firmly than than I would now knowing what I know now with the amount that I've played with so yeah yeah Jill good good point um a distaff just to keep your animals and your pets out of your fiber um that was something that came up in uh um one of our one of our zoom meetings recently so can you use a thinner piece of dowel oh there's no advantage Alex it's just what you like um I have another one that the dowel is three quarters this is three quarter inch dowel I just find this a little bit heavier it's a little bit um a little bit too heavy for me um, this one is still 20 inches. It's about 21 inches long. Um, I borrowed this one from Kim as well. And this is a, um, it's a half inch dowel. This is, oh, sorry. It's not half an inch. It's uh, five eighths. And, um, I just find this one, it's heavier wood. It's a little bit more solid. The other one's lighter. Um, I just like it a little bit better, but just play around to see what you find. Go into the hardware store and hold them. See what you think. You just have to try. Um, all right. What else do we have to talk about? We talked about that. We talked about that. Um, we've got, I've got some knitting in progress. So why don't we talk about that really quickly and then we'll go into community participation. Um, my shifty is, it's coming along. I haven't been working on it a ton. Um, I finished the body, which you guys know. Um, and then the last couple of weeks, I thought that I would have at least a sleeve done. But I don't, alas, I don't. So I'm down to the last bit of the sleeve. Um, I think I, I think I'm about 13 inches into the sleeve. Um, I am going to knit them to a full length sleeve. So this will be the card, the the sweater itself, because it basically is double knit because you've got two layers of of fabric because you're carrying that the the mosaic stitches, lots of slip stitches. Um, I will knit full length sleeves cause it's going to be a very warm sweater. There's no point in cutting it short and doing shorter sleeves when, when the sweater is going to be so warm. Um, this is by Andrea Mowry. This is the shifty. I did knit it longer. The body is longer and, um, yeah, so I'll knit to about 17 inches for the, for the sleeves and then I'll do a two inch cuff. So kind of getting to the end of the sleeve. I think it's about, I measured it at work the other day, but I, I don't remember how where I was at. I know I was at 11. Yeah, I'm at 12 inches. So I've still got a ways to go. About five inches, five inches to go. I had predicted that once I had the sleeves and the blue added that it would kind of tie the whole sweater together. And I think that's definitely been the case. If I were to do this again, I think I would blend the colors a little bit more rather than having sort of striping per se. Um, I'm not going to rip it out and redo that. I really like the green. I think the sweater itself has really worked out well. It's a great learning experience opportunity and experience and actually I put it on the other day to try it on um and I put a one of my gray uh vests over top which I wear a lot when we're camping and um it actually I, I really liked it so definitely something that I will wear for sure one of the reasons why I haven't made a lot of progress on my shifty is because I actually started another sweater I really wanted to get this yarn knit up but I'm gonna have to rip back so that's why it's kind of on hold now um, I wanted to cast on for the Magnolia Bloom, which is a pullover. Priscilla in our community knit the cardigan version of this. It's knit on really, really big needles. And because this yarn, it's custom woolen mills, uh, four ply CVM. It's very firmly spun. There's some nylon in here. I've, I've worked with this yarn before and ripped everything that I've made in this yarn out. Um, it's, uh, I, I knew based on like past experiences and my wrists and stuff that I would have to knit on bigger needles. So this is six and a half millimeter needles. And it's just this massive chunky lace bobble pattern. It's just totally crazy, really different from what I normally make. However, the neck is too tight. So when I pull it on, it's like right up here and it's quite tight. Um, so I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I do have to rip it out. Um, if I rip it off, um, I was thinking that I would re-knit it on the bigger needles. So I downsized to six millimeter needles for the neck. 
So what size needles are these? US 10.5 and US 10s. So I had done this on six millimeter or US size 10 and it's, it's just too tight and it won't block out because um, it's just, it's just not that kind of yarn, you know? It's not gonna relax enough to be comfortable. So what I think I'm gonna do is just pick up with the six and a half millimeter and see what that looks like. Um, it's an oversized sweater, it's quite big. If I stand up, it doesn't look very big because I'm holding it on me and the stitches are all bunched up. But when I put it on, like the, it's a it kind of ends up looking like a drop shoulder. It's not, it's a, it's a top down yoke. Um, but like the sleeve openings are quite big and it's just kind of, it's just big and oversized and yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I have enough yarn. I'll see it through. I don't know. <laughs> I really like it. Like I like the color and I like the pattern. I love the chunky lace. I think I'm really quite taken with that. Um, but the big, big oversized kind of cloud like sweater. I don't know. I don't know. So we'll see. Um, I have been working with, the last thing I wanted to share with you is just really, really, really quick. I've been working with my CVM. So this was a three ply CVM from some fiber that I split with my friend Greta that Liz of Kingdom Fleece and Fiber Works as she pin drafted for me and Greta. And I spun during Tour de Fleece about 500, um, about 600 yards of yarn. And uh, I, cast on for the spark cardigan so based on my gauge swatch um I actually hit gauge almost like exactly which is really great so um this is sort of knitting up to be a heavy dk it's not quite a worsted weight um although the pattern calls for worsted weight I am knitting so based on my gauge swatch I'm knitting size two so we'll see how that goes uh, this is a pattern by Andrew Mowry, the Spark Cardigan. I think a lot of people know this pattern. It was really popular. It's been really popular since it was published. I chose it more out of a process of elimination. So I, uh, I had hoped actually to spin and knit this cardigan out of this project. Um, but I've kind of got this earmarked now for something else, um, for another color work sweater. So what I thought I would do with this is actually, um, cause I pulled out the cathedral. It just wasn't working. So I just abandoned ship and we're moving on. So, um, I actually have taken my breed and color study, my Shetland yarn. This is my three ply fractal that I did and I'm holding it. Uh, it's going to be the color work for my spark cardi which is really fun. So I have more than enough yarn for the sweater out of my three ply fractal. Um, I did one strand of white. Uh, so a, a half of, I used half of each of the braids. So this is a total of 150 grams. Um, I used uh, one strand of white, one strand of gray and one strand of murat, and I did a three ply fractal. And this will, what I did and the intricacies of what I did will be coming out in our content in May and June. Um, so I don't want to go into it now because we need to get to community participation. But um, you can see the natural striping pattern on the inside of the skein. So that's going to be really neat. It's going to come up, like as it works up, the color work comes up the sweater, it'll, it'll really work well. So with this CVM, it's just a really nice match. It's a nice match in fiber quality and in micron count and bouncy, bouncy springiness. And um, so I've been spinning more CVM on my minstrel uh, because I'm pretty sure that I don't quite have enough yardage. I had gotten myself into the color work section of this sweater and I had to rip out because I did the ribbing wrong. I set up uh, for the ribbing at the front for the sneaking, I set it up wrong. So um, redoing that, had to rip it all out, had to start all over again. That's kind of just the way this week has been. And, um, I'll be sharing more about that as I, as I work on it. So that's really, really fun. Let's go to community participation. So for March, um, for our giveaway for March in the episode thread on Ravelry or here on YouTube. So please don't comment in the live chat. Uh, make actually like a comment here on, on YouTube um, or go to the uh, episode thread on Ravelry. I've linked it in the show note in the uh, live stream so that you guys can see uh, so you can go there directly. Um, but just tell us what spring or fall is like in your area of the world. We're right on the right on the brink of summer of spring solstice here. And so um, 
tell us in your area of the world, whether you're in the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere, what spring or fall is like in your area of the world. I'm super excited about my spark cardigan, Dana. Um, and what we'll be giving away this month uh, for March, I've been going through my stash, as I mentioned, and I've been going through um, and uh, deciding what to keep and what to let go of. So I now have a massive box of fiber to give away for you guys on the, on the podcast. And so what we're going to do first is specifically for our dear, dear friend, Kelly, is the lava colorway. I've got this little bump left over. It's half of a braid of panda, um, bamboo nylon, um, bamboo nylon, merino bamboo nylon. Um, and, uh, it's half of, half of a, uh, half of a braid and it's, uh, Katrina's colorway lava love, which is Kelly's favorite colorway. And, uh, I did a pair of socks out of this, uh, for the content for sweet Georgia and for Patreon, um, the spinning socks content. And I had a whole other half of the, of the braid left over. So you can either choose from that or you can choose from Targi. Because I know some people don't like the bamboo nylon and they want just the springy, gorgeous colorway. So you can pick one or the other. And they're both they're both 50 grams. You can like you can really do something um, with this. And I, I did strip a little bit of this down, but it's all here. And um, you could do a fractal, which is amazing in this colorway. Um, you could do it as contrast in a tube, contrast in a color work tube. A three ply fractal spun with um, a little, like a moderate amount of twist, like a you know a good amount of twist, and then used as the color work for a shifty toque. That would be perfect. Anyways, you can pick from which one you want, and that is for the March giveaway. Um, so, oh, you guys are talking about the uh, CVM. Okay. Cool. Uh, thank you for answering those questions, uh, you guys. Um, yeah, CVM is uh, it's a really bouncy, springy medium wool. Um, Rommeldale and CVM's one is the colored version. Um, they're becoming more, I've really noticed in the last year or two, they're becoming more and more common. Um, and they, they're, um, I've got my, my book right here. So let's just go back a bit. And we'll talk about this for just a sec. Um, California Reds, um, doesn't actually say where they're from. This is what they look like. If you guys want to see, um, sorry, that's kind of a bit dark, but that's sort of what they look like there. And if I go to Rommeldale, um, Rommeldale and CVM, here we go. Sorry. This is the one to look at. So Rommeldale and CVM. Um, they are specific colored strain of Rommeldales. Uh, they're two. So Rommeldale and CVM were for a while considered two separate breeds, but now they're just CVMs are being uh, managed as the specific colored wool strain of Rommeldales. Um, so whatever their classification, these sheep offer hand spinners and other fiber aficionados consistently soft wool with from with a multitude of solid and variegated natural colors so me and Greta had split two fleeces one was that gorgeous tawny gray that I shared with you earlier in the show and the other one is actually a gorgeous light gray um, they're really 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 pretty origin is here in the United States um, it's a originally a cross of Romney and Rambouillet um, and they started in California in 1915. They have a sort of a badger faced look to them and best uses next to the skin clothing and other cuddly items. The wool felt well. Um, the nice thing about Rommeldale and CVM that I've really noticed is it's not super expensive. It's kind of, um, kind of like Finn and, uh, Corydale and, Romney, um, it's not super expensive. So, and I'm seeing it more and more often. So, um, definitely something to watch for, even if you're not in North America. And there are so many people here in the wool and spinning community. If you're looking for something, just reach out to people on the Slack channel under hashtag stash busting. If you're looking for something, just put a call out. 
um, because uh, somebody might send you some that's in their stash that they're not particularly attached to. So, uh, and sometimes shipping is not as much as you'd think it would be, um, especially if somebody can vacuum pack something for you. All right, so for the February giveaway, we were talking about fitting issues and Megan's comment on Ravelry number 18 was the winner. And so Megan, I'll be sending you uh, a thing, the, the try it on tubing. Um, her comment about fit was, as I've knitted for over 20 years now, largely for myself, I'm much better at fit. I struggled with fit for many, many years in many, many ways, but I think the last three to five years, I have made a ton of progress. I think the two biggest things I've learned are number one, use a muslin, a shirt, a sweater, whatever you're knitting and find something in your closet that you like the fit of and match it. And number two, try it on, try it on, try it on. I'm generally happy with my fit if I do these two things. Thank you, Megan. Good to see you, Becca. Thank you so much for joining us. So our first uh, community participation is actually from Lisa. This is for our Breed and Color Studies on Shetland, which is running until the end of June. Lisa has been processing a brown fleece um, with silver in it. Uh, it's a Shetland cross that sat in her stash for about 10 years. Uh, because it had a weak spot in the staple and it couldn't withstand combing. So instead, so she was disappointed, but it was time to pull it out. And she flicked the locks uh, to pull out the short broken bits and she ran it all through the carter. This looks amazing, Lisa, amazing. She is left with 365 grams out of 550. That's pretty good. Um, so the waist was high, the loss was high, the waist was high, but that's still pretty good. Um, and she'll be able to do a lot with it. I totally agree, Lisa. You, this, this is still a decent amount of fiber. Like, you know, depending on how you spin it and what you decide to do with it, like that's the background for a color work sweater for sure. This next one is from Allison, also breeding color study. Um, she combined her breeding color study with her 51 yarns spin along, which was great. She's been working on the structure section of 51 yarns in conjunction with her study. She used some of the half braids of, Sh of the Shetland that she bought from Katrina, and this is what she's completed so far. So for her two ply, she had some of the white base of the Shetland after creating the three ply. So she bracelet plied them together what was left over. Um, she also stripped for another two ply structure, she stripped half of the braids into four half ounce bundles. Um, and one of the yarns she, um, created for the study was a strip of each base plied together. So one white and one more it, and then one oatmeal. And that was her, her, uh, uh, three ply structure. So lots of different yarns. And she also did a chain ply. And that's this one here. And she couldn't believe how different the color interplay was of the three. Isn't that incredible? So the one closest to me is the two ply. The middle is the three ply and the end is that chain ply. Isn't that incredible how different they are? I think I said the one that was chain ply was um, actually her three ply. So sorry about that, um, Allison. Beautiful. Ch the chat is blowing up from all of your projects, you guys. This one is from Kathy. I love this so much. Um, she wanted to report progress on her Shetland spin. So she ended up making Michelle Wang's uh, Ondawa pattern that this sweater is just gorgeous. Um, from a previous experience knitting this, she had a pretty good idea about yardage and sizing. Um, since she didn't have a large quantity of hand spun, she was playing a little bit of yarn chicken. Um, but she had a small first fleece from Sprite, that's the sheep's name, and it is super soft. It's also absolutely beautiful, Kathy. She used up all of the three ply and had to finish the last several inches of the second sleeve uh, with leftover two ply. But you know, you can't tell. Really love the pattern. And it looks awesome on you, Kathy. That is just beautiful. Stunning. Love, love, love this sweater. Thanks all. It's beautiful. Yeah, beautiful, you guys. Um, oh, and Allison, you're here today. That's awesome. Um, so good when people are in the chat and I talk about you. <laughs> All right, so that's from Kathy. Thank you so much. The next stuff, is, the next one is from Linnea. Um, Linnea, this is for 51 Yarns. This is Group B. So they are working through their second year uh, right now of their 51 Yarns Spin Along based on the book 51 Yarns to Spin Before You Cast Off by J.C. Box Faulkner. One of my favorite spinning books out there. I think it's just a really great way to work through a ton of yarns and spin them and learn. 
So Linnea did her low twist singles. Um, she really enjoyed this spin and she spun the split and pre-drafted top supported long draw. Um, she was trying to keep trap track of her ted treadling. She tied a piece of yarn from the wheel to her fiber hand to keep the same drafting distance. She was very excited to see how the yarn would come out after the washing and fulling. It's the first time she's made singles. Well done, Linnea. And um, that will stay as singles. And it was the first time fulling anything. She's very happy with the results. Beautiful. And it will not be the last time making low twist singles. I always say that about low twist singles. I, there's just nothing like low twist singles. It, your yarn, Linnea, looks like a, a skein of Malabrigo Merino worsted singles. Like that's that's how this just is excellent. Really beautiful, really well done. Holly's been working on her self-striping yarns. So she's currently spinning her tweed, but here is her self-striping yarn. Um, she didn't set out to make a hat with this yarn, but she, when she finished the yarn, it just sort of screamed hat. So she ended up doing a three ply because it was a self-striping. So she chain plied it. It's about 141 yards from four ounces. Next time I spin fine merino, I will try to make a less dense yarn. However, this is a very wearable hat because it is soft and plump. And I think it's probably more durable than it otherwise might have been. I think you're right, Holly. Ultimately, she went through an emotional roller coaster with this yarn from being elated, disappointed, discouraged, despairing, and then back to hopeful a full circle to elated and satisfying. Who knew that spinning was going to be such an emotional journey? <laughs> That's why our spinning is so good to work out emotional problems, I think. <laughs> well done, Holly. Everybody's saying gorgeous. Um, yeah, Leanne, it's so funny that you would make that comment about um, that your husband loves the uh, title. I, I think that's part of why it's so much fun to say, you know, 51 yarns to spin before you cast off. I just, I love the imagery that that kind of um, elicits because it doesn't, it's not, I think in immediately we kind of go to like casting off like the end of our life, right? And, and <coughs> sort of that idea. <laughs> oh, sorry, you guys. But I think it also speaks to before you cast off, like before you kind of go on to the next stage of life or onto the next um, project, onto the next um, uh, making journey that you might be going on to, um, more yarns that you want to spin in the future, knitting projects, things that you want to use your yarns in. I think there's just, it elicits such a wonderful uh, amount of imagery. It's not just before the end of our life. <laughs> Um, so I think when you kind of stop and actually think about it, it's a really lovely, um, uh, imagery. Uh, yeah. I don't know how else to say that. Luxury fibers along. This is from Elizabeth. This is her, um, Bombex sample. And she's also started spinning her Muga silk. So these were, uh, samples from, uh, the Sanjo spinning box that they made for us in the woolen spinning community. Um, there was a discount that was offered and it was in uh, the housekeeping stuff for January and February. I think it's still available on their website. Just look for the uh, woolen spinning spinning spin box, spin sampler. Um, she says the Bombex was really challenging. She found the fiber short and she had trouble with the twist building up too fast and she had to make adjustments to her wheel. It also took her all of her attention to spin. It feels crunchier. Um... And the Muga was longer and it was a lot easier to spin. It doesn't feel, but it does, but it did end up feeling a bit crunchier. So um, maybe not as slippery, but uh, so that might be why I'm finding it a lot easier. I'm curious what everyone else's experience have been. Would you, what did you think about the silk? And also I haven't found, oh, and also she hasn't finished the Bombex samples yet. Um, so how should you finish it? So she was wondering about finishing um, with your silk yarn, soak them in some gentle soap. You don't want to introduce lanolin because of course these, these aren't wool. Um, so some gentle soap, hot water, not too hot because you can turn your, your silk into suede. Um, so I like, um, you know, water that's hot enough, but that I can still put my hand into and just leave them to soak. Some people leave them for quite a long time. It takes, um, up to, I think it's like 12 hours for the silk, to, for the water to penetrate all of the silk fibers. So I often forget about my yarns anyways when I go to wash and finish them. So just put them in the water and just walk away and leave them. Beautiful spinning, um, Elizabeth. Pia also uh, shared this gorgeous photo of her Turkish spindle. This is for her, the luxury fibers along as well. 
And this is Progress on her Polworth and Tussa Silk. Just gorgeous. And talk about um, a gorgeous winding of your cop. That's just beautiful. Still debating on whether to make this a two-ply or a three-ply. I think either would be amazing, Pia. Thank you for sharing. Uh, next is from Kaylee. So this is Natural Shades Along in our Zero to Hero. This is a year-long thing that we're working on. And we're probably, let's face it, going to keep on going into 2022. She started this spin trying to use up 200 grams of Jacob from a prepared fleece. She loves grays and had toyed with this fleece a lot, but she found that she has learned a lot since she first started prepping it. It was originally uh, partially combed, some carded, but it was all a mess. Her early bats were clumpy and not very well combined, so she carded them again, trying to keep all the fibers aligned and going slowly, and then she pulled them through a diz. She found this makes a big difference to keep things aligned, but also airy. She intended to make a two-ply, but the fiber was so fine that she let it um, as she was spinning and made a three-ply instead. Beautiful. So she ended up with 500 yards from 166 grams. Ended up being a 14 wraps print yarn. It is just beautiful, Kaylee. Beautiful. Well done. So I'm excited to see what you do with it. This is from Noemi. Uh, this is last week she found a moth in her precious uh, fiber share mini stash, which is terrible, but it also made her clean it, freeze it, and spin through it urgently. So she hopped in with us. And the good thing is that the moth is now gone. <laughs> Um, and she's purchased two mitten patterns from Carol's Sunday that she's going to test these yarns in. And these are just beautiful. There are a whole bunch of different, um, uh, um, brands or not brands, uh, sheep breeds from in and around the part of Europe that she's from. So there's, there, are, um, uh, specific breed samples from German regions. So the gray is Pomeranian sheep, the brown, I can't say. And then the cream is Cobra Fox, which we talked about last week. So I'm just going to pop what she wrote into the live chat so that you guys can see the different breeds rather than me trying to, um, uh, wreck how they are actually said. Because, you know, that always happens. So beautiful spinning there, uh, Noemi. And, and uh, I look forward to seeing your finished items, actually. So please make sure that when you're knitting that you post them. This is from Tracy. Uh, she has enough yardage for her shifty sweater. I think so. And now the part she doesn't like. She's trying to figure out which skeins to use. So if you guys have any initial thoughts and ideas, please throw them into the live chat for Tracy. Um... She doesn't plan on following the designer's way of changing colors, and she would love to see any options that we see that um, she might be able to do. The second picture is more monotone. Um, so she was sort of wondering about this one. It has the greens in there. There's the purple and green skein way, way at the end there next to that, that other purple one. And then this, this is sort of more of a monotone. Although you'd get quite a bit of contrast between the blue and purple as you were knitting through. But like mine, you probably won't get a ton of contrast in the yoke if you use yarns that are so closely related. And if you want to see the green and blue together, that's what it looks like at the end. So there's very little contrast between the green and the blue. So that might be something for you to think about. But then you can see the contrast between the ready purple and the green is more marked in mine. So you can kind of see from mine what it would look like. And then you can uh, make your decision from there, Tracy. And people are um, making comments in the in the chat. So that's great. Very helpful, you guys. Thank you. Finally, we have a share from Sherry. This is just one of my favorite patterns. This is a finished owl sweater from Kate Davies using raw fleece that she purchased from a local to me shepherdess. The fleece went over went off to Dakota Fiber Mill and it came back in three large bags of roving. She wanted the yarn not to pill, but to still have good stitch definition. So she went for a cabled yarn uh, using her new Ashford E-Spinner 3. That's wonderful, Sherry. Congratulations. Um, she spun the single Z, so going um, uh, clockwise. And then she uh, plied S, and then she spun uh, and cabled Z. So um, the cabled yarn, this was a cabled yarn learning experience for me. And the next sweater's worth of fleece or yarn uh, we'll have better cable structure in the yarn as she applies more of what she learns. I think you nailed it here, Sherry. Really beautiful. Really well done. Um, I was wondering if you're going to sew on the buttons for the eyes or if you're going to leave them off or maybe do it on one. Uh, I really like the owl sweater when instead of doing 
uh, buttons on every single owl. I like it when it's only on one owl so that people, when they look at the sweater and they see that, they're like, oh, it's owls and they can see it, but not so many buttons all over the sweater. That's just my, my taste. I've actually been meaning to knit this sweater again. I knit one and then I ripped it out and I re-knit it because the first one was too big. And uh, I've always meant to, I've, I've always meant to make another one and I, I haven't. And then seeing this uh, made me want to make it again. So I also thought Nora would maybe want one. So I was motivated to do something matchy matchy for us. This community never ceases to amaze. You guys are always making such amazing things. There's always so much to share. So thank you so much. The Slack channel has been particularly busy recently uh, and you guys have been posting so much. So thank you so much for, for that continued enthusiasm. For those who are participating, we've got queries and explorations next that will start at 10 a.m. I will start the meeting right away and then we'll plan to actually start start at 10 uh, at 10. So in about eight minutes, um, I just need to use the washroom and get a refill of coffee. So until next time, you guys, I'll see you here next same time, same place next weekend at 830 Pacific Daylight Time. We're changing our clocks tonight at 2 a.m. So as of Tomorrow we will be in daylight time here in the Pacific Northwest. And um, until next time, happy spinning, happy knitting, happy weaving, happy dreaming. And I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye.